important once we have restored a minimal tissue perfusion pressure. So if you like, I just uh, wrote this piece about how, to, you know, how organ dysfunction could occur and how we could prevent it. And since this was a, um, a journal for nephrologists, I raised the question, what have we found in critical care medicine that could protect the kidneys and improve kidney function? You can go around it, as we did for ALDS in the next room a bit earlier. Nothing has been shown to really improve outcomes in ALDS. But it's the same for kidneys, except that here we can improve perfusion. For the lungs, it's not really something we can achieve. But um, increasing arterial pressure, renal blood flow, blood volume, that's the only thing we can do to prevent kidney failure. Uh, antioxidants have not worked. Um, bicarbonate has not worked. We are not even sure that contrast-induced nephropathy is a real problem. And um, dopamine at low doses doesn't work. Phenaldapam the same. Uh, what, 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 what have we found? Nothing else than improving the oxygen delivery to the cells. Now, admittedly, the situation is quite complex, of course. It's not just blood pressure and, uh, and cardiac output. There may be some significant microvascular alterations. There may be, of course, inflammatory responses that influence these uh, circulatory alterations. And indeed, we need to go, if we speak about the kidneys, this paper just came out as well, we need to look at the microcirculation, not just the macrocirculation. And, um, you know, we start to learn about some interventions that could really influence the microcirculation in, a, in hurting it, in making it worse. And here I'd like to say a few words about PaO2. Because exactly as I showed the same slide for hypovolemia and hypervolemia, we can write it for hypoxemia and hyperoxia. I think it's a very topical problem. We need to all be very well aware of that. If we think that oxygen delivery is important, we should not pour oxygen in our patients. Look at this study from Safa, uh, from, um, from uh, uh, ASFA and co-workers showing that when you give too much oxygen in patients with septic shock, you may worsen their outcomes. And I wrote the accompanying editorial raising the point that as we think about it, the microcirculation can be impaired by high PaO2. I don't know if Mervyn agrees, but I think that's, do you agree with me, Mervyn? But now, do you agree with that? And so, and there are studies showing that hyperoxia can, of course, bring more oxygen-free radicals, but could also impair the microcirculation. I don't know if you saw this meta-analysis just published in The Lancet now one week ago. It's a nice meta-analysis because it puts the things together, showing that in neurological injuries, like in cardiovascular injuries, when you give too much oxygen, you may actually make things worse. And the nurse at the bedside may be happy because the SpO2 is at 100%. People may be happy because the PO2 is high. Who cares? But we need to be concerned about this. Moving to vasopressor agents, and indeed that's what we indicated just a minute ago, with the um, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines, we didn't know what to say about vasopressin. There are some nice experimental data, including from our lab, but I will not discuss them now, showing that vasopressin could perhaps limit oedema formation by improving endothelial cell function. But, um, of course, vasopressin could have pro and con effects. And now to show you some very new things. You may think that giving too much catecholamines, too much vasopressor, could indeed alter organ function. I agree. 
But maybe we could replace a little bit of adrenergic agents with uh, vasopressin. And this paper came out yesterday <laughs> in the JAMA. It's a meta-analysis again, looking at the effect of vasopressin in patients with distributive shock. And very interestingly, they found that there was less atrial fibrillation in the group receiving some vasopressin, probably avoiding excessive influences of adrenergic agents. There may perhaps be something on mortality as well, although when the investigators separated the high quality studies from lower quality studies, the real message did not hold. So perhaps there is an effect on survival, but it's not entirely clear yet. Now, it doesn't mean that vasopressin is perfect. It means that we need to be cautious about excessive use of vasopressors. Vasopressin could induce cutaneous lesions, peripheral vasoconstriction, and that was the case in the meta-analysis too. There were more digital ischemias in patients receiving vasopressin. But I think it's interesting that we find some alternative to vasopressor agents. I'll speak about it tomorrow morning when I speak about, you know, how we could improve our strategies with, uh, uh, in, uh, in patients with uh, sepsis and septic shock in particular. We know that we will have angiotensin II available in Europe, and so we will have to find out when we give it. We already had discussions about it at the last symposium in Brussels last March. If you think about it, and again, we'll discuss it further tomorrow, there may be a renal protective effect. If you think that ACE inhibitors may induce some uh, renal dysfunction by vasodilating the efferent arterioles of the kidney, here we may have the reverse effect. And perhaps in patients who are on renal replacement therapy, perhaps there is an improvement in outcome. It's a subgroup analysis. There were not so many patients there, but we will have to discuss this in terms of uh, improving the uh, circulation. And then, of course, maintaining flow is fundamentally important, regardless of the vasopressor we use going back to oxygen delivery to the tissues, perhaps we need to maintain a relatively high oxygen saturation in the venous blood. Yeah, we all continue to discuss the reverse study on early goal-directed therapy. It's old stuff now. It's 17 years old, but it makes sense. It makes sense to try to bring just enough oxygen to the cells. You may say, and I'm sure Dr. Payen will agree with that, I'm sure he agrees with that, that we have three negative prospective randomized control trials on early goal directed therapy. But as we have argued several times, patients already had a relatively normal SVO2 in these studies, whereas it was low in the reverse study. The point being that Maybe the randomized controlled trials have a problem. It's not the physiology which has a problem. And bringing enough oxygen to the cells could still make sense. And um, Professor Gattinoni has a nice paper that will appear in chest showing the importance of uh, SCVO2 as patients keeping a low SCVO2 do have a worse outcome in sepsis. And I will write the editorial tomorrow on this, accompanying that paper. Now, you may argue that, indeed, patients in the reverse study were sicker than in the subsequent studies. They also received more blood. And maybe there is something there as well blood transfusions, even though there is a large prospective randomized control trial from Scandinavia showing that it doesn't influence mortality, it was a study on overall transfusions. Because in one group, all patients were transfused. And in the other group, 
64% of patients were transfused. 64% of patients with septic shock, that's already quite many. So it is really a study showing that we should not give too many transfusions. The point being that if early goal directed therapy doesn't work, it's okay, but oxygen delivery remains important and SCVU2 is still an important variable, exactly as central venous pressure or the blood pressure or the heart rate or the calacopic. And indeed, <coughs> Professor Gattinoni and others showed that just trying to bring SCVO2 or SVO2 in this case to, let's say, 70% in all patients does not improve outcomes. We need to individualize our therapies. We always go back to the same conclusion. And lastly, to again emphasize the importance of oxygen delivery to the tissues, we could speak about lactate levels that largely reflect inappropriate oxygen utilization by the cells. We know that repeating the lactate levels over time can give a good idea about the global improvement of uh, the patients who may be in shock. Some people have called it lactate clearance. No, it's not clearance. No, 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 no. It's production and clearance. And we should not speak about lactate clearance, but repeated lactate levels or lactate kinetics, if you like. In the best conditions, lactate levels will go down by 10% in one hour. That's one of my first publications back in the early 1980s, 10% in one hour. So if you look at all these studies looking at lactate changes over time, you will find that measuring lactate levels every hour or every two hours can bring you some important information. And again, we'll discuss it further tomorrow as it is the end of the day. So, um, Finishing up about oxygen delivery, maintaining it to an appropriate level, not too much. You may say, oh, transfusions can be bad. Transfusions are not necessary when the hemoglobin level is above 7 or 70 grams per liter. Well, we just published this paper from a study some of you participated in, the ICON study which is a study looking at patient populations over time in our intensive care units. Of course, patients with a very low hemoglobin level can benefit from blood transfusions. But as you can see here, the patients who are not very sick do not benefit from blood transfusions. And this is consistent with many observations in surgical patients, in patients who are mildly ill. We should not over transfuse them. Yeah, that's correct. But look at patients having the highest severity scores, the highest SUPS2 score, the highest SOFA scores. They do benefit from blood transfusions. And globally, when we do multivariable analysis, there is an improved survival with blood transfusions in patients who are the sickest. So again, a patient is not a patient is not a patient we need to individualize our therapies. And I will end up here emphasizing that indeed, altered tissue perfusion is the key. And if we want to prevent multiple organ failure, that's the most efficient way. It is to bring enough oxygen to the tissues when hypotension has been corrected. But if we exaggerate, there is a price to pay. Don't try to bring the PaO2 to high levels. Don't give too many transfusions. Don't give too many inotropic agents. I didn't cover it here, but it's clear to all of us. We spoke enough about IV infusions. We also speak about excessive vasoconstriction. We need to navigate between the hypos and the hypers and individualize the care of the critically ill patients. Grazie mille.